Dr. James Keach is the assistant extension agent for ornamental crops and the master gardener coordinator for CTAR in the county of Kauai. He is a plant breeder and has worked with a range of ornamental and edible, edible crops, including taro and sweet potato. In his current role, he hopes to expand the range of plants and new cultivars available to the ornamental community. Dr. Keach will be talking about the Kauai County Ornamental Research Updates. Dr. Keach, thank you for joining us. I'll talk a little bit about some of our inventory of germplasm or different plant materials. I'll be talking a little bit after that about a new disease on Costas that we've discovered recently. I'll talk a little bit about import replacement plants that we've gotten from Maui and how those are doing, and then a few plants that I've purchased or we're trialing currently. Uh, the next thing at the very end, I'll talk about some future projects. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the inventorying of these different existing floral germplasm. Uh, this is a collection of plants that was brought in mainly by Roy Yamakawa and Roger Peckinpah, collected throughout Central and South America. The plants have been at the station for over 10 years now, and so we have pretty good information about which ones have done well and which ones haven't. I'm presenting these with the information we have available from our maps and from notes, but I welcome any sort of information that anyone in the audience might have. Uh, we're hoping that the information on this from a growth at about 500 foot elevation will be useful, and I'm also hoping that this information will get some interest out and help us set priorities for our research and some of the materials that we have here. You know, as is the case across the board, we're seeing limited funds, limited resources, and so we want to know where to kind of prioritize things. So I'll start out with some of the gingers we have up at the station. On the left here, we have Otensiae. This is a true ginger, a zingiber, and more of a shampoo type. Uh, this one produces some of that shampoo-like mucus, but it's a really nice gingery scent. Stems are a little short, but it produces uh, abundantly while it's in flower and then does have a short dormancy period. We have another one called chocolate ball that goes into dormancy earlier. Uh, we think this could have some really good application, and we know this is being grown in other locations so far. Siam rose on the right here is a ginger relative and actually closely related to the torch gingers, which I'll be touching on in a bit. So Siam rose has actually been an incredible producer for us. Uh, if harvested young, it looks more like the flower in the photo on the right, uh, with a somewhat shorter stem, but a really nice kind of tight, compact whorl. As it gets older, the center tends to fade out and has some sorts of infection, but these can actually still be used in different arrangements where you're not focusing on the center or where the plants are elevated. So we're looking for information and in how people are interested in these and whether they could be useful. Uh, torch gingers, we have some that are already present in industry right now, like white torch over here on the left. This one is nice in that we see different kinds of color tones as the flowers progress, ones that start out sort of white and then fade to kind of a pink with a white center. The one on the right is one that I haven't seen as much in collections, Borneo Pink. And this one is interesting because it's a little bit tighter than some of the other torch gingers we're used to seeing. It stays in this kind of almost tulip-like shape and has a little bit of that gingery fragrance as well. I'll also touch on this because one thing we've noticed is it seems to be very fertile and might have some breeding opportunities. We have a large collection of Heliconia, uh, both Orthotrica and some of the other species. And these were some of the focus of the uh, collection by Roy and by Roger. These three were, in particular, were released several years ago. Uh, and there's an official CTAR publication release on these. The one on the left, Kauai Morning Sun, is an incredibly abundant producer of flowers. Uh, when I was walking through harvesting flowers for tomorrow's field day, I almost couldn't fit them all in one armful. It's just simply amazing. Uh, it also will flower over a range of months. And these three selections were actually picked to not only complement each other, but to also show a range of different month maturities so that you could keep harvesting and continue even when there are normally gaps in Heliconia production. Uh, Kauai Christmas, we're still working to make sure this is the one that was originally released. But this one tends to have a little bit darker coloration, and as the name suggests, tends to mature around Christmas time. Kwai Sunset is also dark and has a really nice kind of contrast between the base color and the border. 
Uh, some of the other selections we have hadn't been released, and so we are sort of still collecting information. And some of them are even starting to run together a little bit. Uh, the ones that are up on the screen right now, 4204 and 4217, tend to mature early September and then into October. They flower for about three months and have pretty good production during those three months. As you can see, you can either harvest them sort of younger and get more of a lobster claw effect, or wait until you get sort of a cascading candelabra. Uh, we also have several in pink tones, uh, 4235, 4236, and 4237. There's a question mark here next to 4236 because there is a little bit of difference compared to the original description of it. And we don't know if this was a mutation or perhaps a planting mistake. Uh, these tend to start flowering a little bit earlier and then tend to stop flowering a little bit later. Uh, but there is really good production while they're in their season. And you can see really nice pink tones. One interesting thing with these is that while they start out as kind of a uniform pink, as they mature, you start to see sort of blocking and other coloration changes that might be interest as you're putting together different arrangements. Uh, we also have collections that include other species and some that have kind of prop, uh, popped up in the field unexpectedly. 433, 4388 is about one month or, uh, later than some of the other ones I've talked about. And so it's good for kind of pushing that maturity window. We've been kind of looking at it because it also has that nice pubescence that some people really appreciate on a heliconia. 501S is a one that arose spontaneously as a seedling. We're still collecting data on this, but it tends, it looks like it's a little bit in between the kind of pink and red color forms. And so we're hopeful that this might have some kind of wider interest to folks who are want to grow it and then use it in arrangements. We have a limited number of Heliconia beehive types as well. Uh, Bubblegum, I managed to get this photo right at the end of the season, so it's not the most representative one. But the nice thing about this is it's more of a solid pink, and if that's what you're going for in an arrangement, it's really great. It also has a kind of bloom on the leaves and on the petioles that can kind of add a blue tone as you're looking for things, or even a silvery tone as you're combining with things like Dusty Miller. Uh, the plants are more upright, and this does make harvesting sometimes a little bit easier than the types where you have to get down further. Uh, we also have some that are kind of more red and orange tones. Again, these are numbered ones, so not necessarily ones we've had released. Uh, you can see very similar in terms of coloration, but just the distinctness of the coloration and some of the shape of the bracts is kind of what distinguishes these. These are also a little bit more upright than the ones I showed earlier. Uh, which makes harvesting a little bit better. And the harvest window uh, tends to be a little bit later too. So this could be another one that could be extended and has some nice red tones for the holidays. We also have a long standing protea trial. These were plants that were originally brought over from Maui and the extensive collection there, now managed by extension agent Hannah Luchin, who will be talking later. Uh, this has been one of the most successful ones for us. 500 feet elevation is a little bit low for some of the proteas, but Henny's torch has been a reliable bloomer for us. And one thing that I've really liked about it is that it's both good at kind of a younger stage when we kind of think of these pin cushions, but also as it tends to fade, it gets a color change. And again, from a distance, it can actually still look really nice. Uh, we are noticing some disease, as uh, Lisa Keith touched on, and then Hannah I know will be talking about as well. Uh, but it hasn't seemed to stop production, and the plant is quite large. We've also been growing Saxosum red, and this plant is sort of the opposite. It uh, doesn't seem to be well adapted to the elevation. It shows the normal problems with elevation, where it tends to kind of sprawl along the ground. In this case, actually, the central plant died off, and we've had it spontaneously root and kind of reproduce itself that way around the field, starting from one plant and now to five plants around kind of the uh, edge of the, where the parent plant was. The neat thing about this though, it's it doesn't appear to have any foliar diseases. And so we're really curious to see if this holds up or as you know, we characterize more of these protea diseases, if this might be a source of resistance for bringing in some of those. I eventually would like to try even maybe a cross between this and Henny's Torch, but that might just be the plant breeder in me. Uh, we've also had a little bit of success with leucodendron. Uh, we've noticed that particularly this one, which doesn't appear to be the same as some of the other ones I've seen in Neotropica, uh, we believe it's called blush, 
This has done well for us. It doesn't form particularly long stems, but it does bear rather abundantly, and the growth is a, a little bit more manageable. Uh, this is a pretty good plant, and we're going to work on trying to propagate it some more. Uh, we also have a large number of banana uh, plants that were donated as ornamentals. Unfortunately, the map has been lost to time, and so we've been kind of just looking at different colors. Uh, some of these match ones that I've seen in commercial trade, some of these don't. Uh, we're also interested in picking up a few more. When I was working in Singapore, Musa coccinia, which has a really beautiful kind of red and orange coloration, was used in arrangements there, and I'd be curious to see how it does under conditions here. But we'd like to kind of get the information out about these in case there are folks who might be interested in trying them in their arrangements. Uh, moving on to costus now, we have a range of different costus, both ones that are useful as foliage and for stems, and then ones that it can be used for flowers. On this uh, slide, we're focusing more on the ones that are kind of foliage type with green flowers. Uh, we have the big leaf costus over here on the left. As you can see, the leaves are quite large. They tend to last pretty well as long as they have enough water, and they're about the length of my forearm uh, for reference. I, I don't know exactly how many inches that is. Uh, the one on the right is Costas pictus, and this one, the flower is all right. You know, it has green with a little bit of a red contrast, kind of inconspicuous, but by far the more interesting thing on this is the stems that have this really distinct striping. You can see a little bit of a gradient here of a younger one on the left uh, compared to ones on the right that have more uh, contrasting markings. Uh, it works really well, and I've given some material of this to designers in the past who've enjoyed using it as a fresh kind of vertical interest in arrangements. Uh, other coasters we have are some that are a little bit more common in the trade. Eskimo Kiss, more of kind of a drumstick type, but one that bears at the ground, uh, so you don't have to necessarily go and chop off all the foliage. This one has been really good. It has these really nice red bracts and then the yellow true flowers. And then the pink coast is showing kind of an older flower here or more of kind of a young flower bud. Uh, again, you do see kind of these nice contrasting true flowers that pop out, but it's a little bit of a time window to get kind of that bud with the true flowers without it kind of looking a little past. Uh, by far the coastus though that's attracted the most attention in our collection is Kiss of Death. This is one that seems to bear a little bit differently depending on where you plant it. We've seen shorter heads that are nice and kind of club-like, or longer, more honeycomb type. Uh, the photo represents the color well, but it's actually a little bit more of kind of a wine dark, almost blackish color uh, in person, and so it's useful for kind of darker themed displays. The true flowers are nice, but again, do tend to fade in an arrangement. We're hoping to get this one out as, again, every time I've brought this out for designers, they seem to really enjoy it and try to put it into their arrangements. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is some Calatheas, and these are ones, again, that we received um, and, but don't seem to match up to ones on the map. We have one that looks like Ludia, the so-called uh, cigar Calathea, but is, this one is several shades lighter. It isn't a brown so much as kind of a nice light orange. It does have true flowers that are kind of uh, more of a maroon and that contrasts really nice as the plant are maturing. This is a shorter plant, maybe three, four feet tall, and so uh, can be grown pretty well even in smaller uh, arrangements. The Calathea, we believe this is a Calathea species on the right. Uh, this is a green one, this is taller, but it forms kind of more intricate inflorescences and so it can be really useful for adding texture to a green arrangement. We, so I've talked a little bit about this germplasm and I've said, you know, I really wanna get feedback on this, but the reason that I'm looking for feedback, as I mentioned, is kind of our resource limitations. Uh, because these plants have been around for a while, we are starting to see diseases build up. Cylindrocladium has been a big problem where we are, but also some other diseases, and we're kind of trying to figure out which ones might be affecting things. Uh, weed pressure has been a problem, and that's primarily because labor has been a big problem. Our uh, agriculture station is 260 acres and includes a herd of 10 goats. We right now have two and a half ag techs, one of whom is presumed to uh, be retiring at the end of year, and another one who has had to leave recently for medical problems. Because of this, we're kind of trying to focus our efforts, see which ones really are of interest to the floral industry, and which ones might be ones that uh, we can kind of 
potentially let go or scale back our production of them. And so I'm hoping that I'll get some feedback from you all about the ones that might be interesting and that then I can be uh, propagating, cleaning up, doing some other work on. So moving on, this is a disease that I just uh, documented within the past year or two. Uh, originally, it looked like herbicide damage, and I'd been called into a grower's field, and they wanted to know what was going on with their costus. I looked closer, and it did sort of follow the herbicide damage links, except we started seeing rings, which is more typical of fungal problems. I sent this to Brian Bush when he was still in his diagnostician position, and he tentatively identified it as anthracnose. Uh, this is m so far only on Costus barbatus, uh, which I believe has been reclassified as chemosis, but we have seen that if other Costus are growing near it, that it can sometimes jump over and cause some damage. Uh, the damage is widespread on the plant. It produces those kind of dried out leaves you saw on the previous slide, but also forms lesions all along the stems and will ruin the flower. Uh, unfortunately, it tends to progress even after the flower has been cut, and so you can have a flower that looks really good put in an arrangement, and then by the time you ship it and it arrives, the whole flower is kind of messed up like this. So we're keeping an eye on this, and I'm hoping to get some research going so we can characterize this and also look into some potential treatments. Right now, I've only seen this on Kauai, and I've only seen this in three physical locations. But if you do see this anywhere else, please do reach out to me so that I can document it and then so that we can progress our research accordingly. Uh, another plant trial we have going on are plants that we received from Maui from their import replacement plants. Uh, these are ones primarily Myrtaceae, ones that the recent Myrtaceae ban means that we can't bring in from other places anymore. And so we wanted to see how they would do at our research station that's a different elevation. By far the winner has been Grevillea Moonlight. These plants started flowering in one, uh, smaller than one gallon pots. We put them into the ground, and they're about three to four feet uh, tall now, only after a few months in the ground. Other plants put into the ground at the same time are maybe one to two feet, including another Grevillea red hooks. We're going to be keeping an eye on all of these. They're still relatively young, so we're not going to see a lot of flowering yet. But we're hopeful that some of these might be ones that we can distribute to interested growers and also potentially do some research on. Um, I should also say the Grevillea moonlight not only flowered in a pot, but it produced seeds. So we're also keeping an eye on it for potential weed risk and want to make sure that you know, we don't introduce something that's going to be another problem. We should also say that all of these are ones that we have assayed uh, with the help of other folks to look at the potential for being uh, rust host for our Ohia rust uh, that's been a problem across the state. I've also been trying to just pick up germplasm anywhere I kind of see it, uh, sometimes from big box stores, sometimes from local nurseries, sometimes ordering it in and then under uh, good conditions, testing it out, making sure I'm not bringing in anything else from the plant. I've got requests for roses in the past. In the top, you can see two roses that didn't do so well. Uh, we tend to have rose beetle damage as a major limiting factor. Uh, but we have seen one in the lower part where two different plants of it have done really well. Unfortunately, this is a smaller rose, not really good for kind of larger arrangements, but I would be interested in seeing how it does for buds for lay. Uh, kind of like Hawaiian green rose is used, and this is one that I've seen people asking for that used to be popular in cultivation, but doesn't seem to be as uh, widespread anymore. I really like the architecture of the plant, but unfortunately the rose beetles damage this one as well. Uh, but we are trying to see how this does, and we're also going to be trying a few other roses that have been donated and that have done well on neighbor islands. More of kind of a landscape plant, but this is one that I picked up recently, yellow ball bean. This is related to kind of the red hot poker plants that we think of, but tends to have a lower profile. I don't think it would do super well as a cut flower, but we do want to check it out. Uh, the flowers are yellow, they're continuous bearing, and it has a small, almost like allium shape, despite not being an a onion family relative. Uh, another thing that I've been looking at for a new germplasm is curcumas, or olena. I know the one in the center is pretty popular in local cultivation, both for the flowers and for the leaves. I'm told people particularly like the leaves because they last a decent period, but also have this really distinctive red stripe. I haven't seen the red stripe in any of the other curcumas, but we have uh, picked up three different uh, cultivars, and we're trialing these right now to see how they do. Right now, the vase life seems to be decent. We haven't done, we don't have enough plants for kind of larger trials, uh, but we are getting at least around two weeks with them, kind of un, under very, very casual observation. 
Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have a photo of myself of Siam Supreme uh, over here on the left. But the nice thing about this and kind of the other one is they have very di different maturity dates. And so we could potentially have them available for a wide range of months out of the year. Uh, I like them because they also have sort of that nice ginger sort of architecture to their flowers. And so it could be used in similar sorts of arrangements. So future projects I'm hoping to endeavor on. As I mentioned, we're kind of working with limited resources, but you know, I'll always tackle another project. Uh, in my, wearing my Master Gardener hat, I've had a lot of Master Gardeners reach out to me about growing Orac, uh, which is shown here in these kind of three cascading photos. Orac's very popular as a green vegetable, but I recently learned that some growers are on the mainland are starting to use it as a cut, as a filler. And so I've ordered these and I'm curious to do a comparison of these and some of the edible types. I figure this could be a good one because folks could use it potentially as a multi-use plant. And there's already evidence that it does well under local conditions. Uh, we are doing a eucalyptus trial. I'm doing that in collaboration with the other ornamental agents and I won't steal their thunder, uh, but we're hoping that that would be another good Mertesia replacement project. Uh, I mentioned that one of the torch gingers seems to be really fertile. This is just one plant uh, of it, but I've counted about seven or 10 different spikes like this covered with seeds. I'm curious to see if these are interspecific or if these are hybrids within the same species and if there's any variation in these. I think we're used to seeing kind of the whites, the pinks, and the red uh, torch gingers. It would be nice to see if we could get some different forms and different things going on with that. So I'll be waiting for these seeds to reach maturity and then planting out a small group of them. Uh, I'm still inventorying plants. It's a huge station, as I mentioned, 260 acres. Uh, we've had some really prolific ornamental agents in the past putting in plants. So every week, every month, I'm discovering new plantings that I haven't had a chance to look over. Uh, these plants at the bottom are some of the ones that are out there, and I'm really hoping we can kind of progress with those. I also didn't get photos of them, but we do have an extensive planting of different types of the Darwin gingers in a range of different pinks. And so we're hopeful that those might also be of interest. I know some are already in circulation, but I've had growers reach out to me. And so again, you know, if I hear from folks that they're interested in this, then that's something I can devote resources to and kind of prioritize. And I'm always open to ideas. I encourage folks to reach out to me. I, as I've mentioned, limited in resources, but you know, always happy to talk story. Uh, at that point, I'll thank, at this point, I'll thank you all for your attention. Uh, my email up address is up here. And I want to specifically thank the uh, staff who've worked with me at the research station, including Frank Matsuno, who's been our farm manager for decades now and just an incredible source of information. Uh, I put this photo in here. This is actually from a friend. Uh, but with my background in tarot, we're also always interested in different foliage plants. And there's a wide range of aeroids I'm seeing enter cultivation that I think could be really useful. Imagine that as kind of the center point of an arrangement and then decorate it with something else. Uh, before I sign off, I'm just gonna ask, uh, we've recently gotten kind of a scolding from administration to remember to collect demographic data. Uh, the link on the left is one that you can fill out. It takes less than 30 seconds, but helps us as we do our federal demographics reporting. And the one on the right is for a seed saving project I'm part of statewide. If you have a chance, uh, that would be great. Oh, sorry, I just see this is an older version, but if you email me, I can give you a copy of the slides for this. Thank you. Thank you, James, for that update on that, all that work you're doing in Kauai County. So thank you for joining us.